Today I want to talk about a word that is used and that we're all familiar with, and the word is church. And I had um, Jeanette read from what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at, at Corinth, how that we're a body made up of many different people, different parts, and all those parts, as you read the whole uh, context of 1 Corinthians 13, are needed. And they're, they're, they're part of a body and part of, as Jesus describes it, the body of Christ. We know it as the church. So there's, there, there is a reason that I am giving this because I'd like for us to understand a more about what the church is, one. Uh, number two, and a, and a major reason for it is more and more Christians are not attending church. And there, there are reasons for that, and we'd like to talk about that. Um, so not only are people not attending church, uh, but also Christians are not attending church, and, they don't, and they're not seeing the value of it. So when we look at the Greek word for church that is used here, and our scripture is going to be in Matthew 16, verse 18. We'll come to that in a moment. But the word is ecclesia, which means an assembly. So for many today, church is thought of as a, we say church, people think of, of a building that makes up a church. And then depending on what faith that you are, the building may look a certain way uh, in, in terms of, because there are all kinds of different churches, whether they be, uh, you know, very high steepled, uh, built in a certain way. Uh, we ourselves, when we built an, an auditorium in Pasadena back there, which was represent the church, it looked more, it had more of a, a temple look to it. Uh, but it was the church. Uh, we called it the auditorium, uh, but, but that's, that's what it was. And people gather at that building, and we have, we have church. <laughs> we, we talk about it as, as having church. But people also avoid church for a myriad of reasons. I'll mention just a, a couple of things. Sometimes people will say, well, I, I would never darken the doors of a church. And uh, they may follow that by the fact is that they may not feel welcome, they may not feel ready, or sometimes they just feel like church is hypocritical. Um, so they don't darken the door of the church. And then we have churchy churches that look have the churchy look about them. So it's like if you're going to go to church, you have to look a certain way because the church looks a, a certain way, and people are, are tend, can tend to be rather uniform in that regard. And then another thing about church is oftentimes it's a collection of like-minded people. Baptists like to attend church with Baptists. Methodists like to attend church with Methodists. Catholics like to attend church with Catholics. Presbyterians like to attend with Presbyterians. And on an, on an Adventist like to attend with fellow Adventists. But not only that, you can be a Baptist, but then you're going to divide in ter terms of social economic. Um, you can be the first Baptist church which is better than the second Baptist church if you're in the same town. And then you can be the Afri African-American Baptist church. You can, you can be, uh, again, we, we segregate by, by races and the like. And so when we think of church, there's all these dynamics that are, that are going on. And then you can have the, the kind of the family church. This is where we, we've always gone as a family. Uh, this is our heritage. This is our tradition. And so church can look a whole like all those things. But I'd like to take a look at what Jesus says about the church. Because he asked a question here uh, to his disciples. And in the midst of the question that he's asking, he makes a statement here. In Matthew chapter 16 and, <clears throat> and verse 18, and this is the scripture central that we're looking at today in verse 18, where he says to the disciples, and I tell you that you, Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will never over." 
overcome it. We'll not overcome it. So with those thoughts in mind, I want us to focus on what Jesus is, is saying here, some of the factors that he has to, is pointing out about the church. One is this. He starts with, I will build. He is the one responsible for building the church. Now, the fact that he uses the word will means it's, it's kind of future. And it's also present. It's like in the process, but I will build a church. And so I will build this assembly. Um, but that's what he is building is a church. So I think it's important to recognize that he is, he is saying, I will do this. It will be a, ch- it is a church that I am building. It is a body of believers that I am building. And so there's in personal involvement in the building. Now I say that to say at the same time, it's easy for people in church building to build their own church, both in terms of building and in terms of, quote, the church, the assembling, people who are allowed in, not allowed, and the like. But Jesus has a personal involvement in building. And I think one of the things that we can come to appreciate that is that he will get, because he is who he is, he will get that job done. Yes. Now, because we can worry about that, we can worry about the fact that there is a decline in church attendance and the like, and think, you know, what is God doing? And yet we see that Jesus gives us some encouraging words. Second it says, I will build my church. Okay. The church is personal to him, and it is his church. If you have, let's say, begun a work, a a church building program, you know, where, let's say you just started in your home, your church grew, and now it's a mega church, uh, it is quite easy to slip into the name of the individual who has built the church. And it becomes kind of personal. This is my church. I started it. Um, I, am the, I am the senior pastor. I am the one in charge. And we tend to take credit for that. That's easy enough to do. And the third point is that death or the grave will not override it. It will last that, that is an important point for us to recognize because if we're talking about something that God wants to go on and on, that it will last, even death will not keep it, then it again points to the importance of what we're, we're seeing here. So these are at least three points that Jesus, that when we focus on this, that real, realize that Jesus is talking about. Now, In context of this proclamation made by Jesus, we want to go back and begin to see how this all came about, what Jesus was talking about when he made this statement. This is beginning here in verse 13 through 19. We see that when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, he could have phrased this a little different. He could have said, who do people say that I am? But rather he says, who do people say the Son of Man is? And their answer was rather a great multitude of answers. They replied, some say John, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So this is the myriad of answers as to who the Son of of Man is by the people when Jesus is asking them to tell him what people were saying about that. But then he, he focuses their attention on themselves and their ideas and their thought. But what about you? So I'm asking the question, You know, who do you say the Son of Man is? What about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? So we can think about who who are we saying? And of course, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ. This is the Messiah. 
uh, which opens up all kinds of doors for our understanding and appreciation, and the Son of the living God. Now, this is important, this last part, the Son of the living God, because church is about God. And if God is not God and God is not a living God, then we're, we're coming to something that has no purpose, has no reason, has no immediacy about it, has nothing in the moment or certainly nothing in the future. Uh, but he says, you are, the, you are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God. And upon this then, Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This is a good thing that you know this. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. So this revelation is important that God is involved in it, in revealing who he is and what he is doing. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So let's take a look at some of the things when it comes to church, what is said and the like here uh, in the context of things that we might learn from this. The, the question is, who is the builder? The builder is the, the very son of God who is building his church. While on the one hand, verses 13 and 14, they're saying, well, who do you say that I am? The builder of the church is not John the Baptist, it is not Elijah, it is not Jeremiah, or it is not a prophet. There are people who have built their churches or their groups on a particular prophet. I know a guy who wrote a book and it's all about one prophet and it's the basis of that one prophet that his whole church is based on. And it's none of those mentioned other than other prophets there. But that, that whole group is based upon that one prophet. In that, though, the one who is missed in that is Jesus. And so on that one prophet, on that, one, that, that amount of information, this person is saying, I have the truth of the matter, and I am the one you, you need to be listening to doesn't sound like the Father in heaven addressing Jesus in the transfiguration when he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. So again, the direct question in verse 15 is, who do disciples think and then who he is? Now, this is important from this perspective. That is, the basis for the church and the true foundation is Christ, Jesus. Okay, he is the one who knows the truth about everything. There is nothing that Jesus uh, doesn't know about the truth and the true foundation. So when we think about church, Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus knows about the church. Jesus knows about who are his and who are not. So there are some interesting things in the Bible about church and about understanding. On the one hand, on the very ultra conservative side of this, you would have individuals where Jesus said, you, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? You teach rather the traditions and the commandments of men. They had their ideas and they stuck to those things. While at the same time that we realize that when Jesus gave the sermon, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you know, you've heard in times past, but I'm telling you. Does he have, does he have any authority to do that? And that's a, absolutely he has authority. That authority was given to him by the Father. Now, the interesting thing about that, what we hear Jesus saying is that I, I, the words I speak are not mine, but they are of the Father. So when we're thinking about church and assembly and all of that, what we speak in church should come from our Heavenly Father through Jesus to, to us and that we're drawn to him. We make up an assembly. We, we come to church and, and there are reasons for that. 
So the basis of all of church and the true foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, the revelation of Jesus also is important to the church. The things that Jesus reveals to us because there are things that we would not understand without revelation. And there's things that he, again, in this case here where he told Peter, this, you understand this only because my Father in heaven revealed this to you. One of the important things about the church that Jesus told his disciples was, I have a lot of things to tell you, which means you, you don't know it all yet, and, but the Spirit will guide you into all truth. Not just guide you, but will guide you into all truth. Uh, the, and, and the Holy Spirit is vital in terms of what, who makes up the church. Uh, when, we, when we read, and this is not in your notes, but we read in Romans chapter 8, as many are as led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. So verses 18 and 19 speaks to the power that is invested in the church based on Jesus. It says, I give you these keys, the keys of the kingdom. What you loose on earth will be loose. What you bind on, on earth will be bound. Now, on the one hand, on the conser- well, I'll call it on the conservative side, you have the individuals who say, I'm in charge. I'm God's apostle on earth. I'm the chief. I'm, I'm Peter. I, I, built, I built this church. I started this from the ground up. It's my church, and I'll make decisions around here. You, you can have, all, or, or this is the way that we have always done it, and we will continue to do that, which I kind of term spiritually Amish. There's a point in time in history where you think this is, this is the apex of everything, and we don't go any further, and there's nothing else to learn. We've learned everything there is to learn, which I would say is, is not a wise thing to believe, and that the church, that God uses the church, uh, that is the assembly of people, to help us to learn things and to progress for our own progression. So when we think about the, the body being many parts, we learn from one another both how to do things and also how not to do things. And so there is, there is, God uses course corrections in, in using human beings along that line. So we see here that there is power given to. On the other hand, now I'm talking about a conservative approach to church. There may be a more liberal approach to church and all that is we can... We can call our life or how we act and how we do whatever we want to do. We can get a, give it a different name than Jesus would give it. And we're free to do whatever we want to do and however we want to do it. And there, there are groups of people who believe that way. They, they can live however they want to live and, and not be held accountable. Uh, and I'm just... For us, I would remind us, Jesus said, this is my church. These are the things that, you know, my teachings and the like. So verse 18, though, does show us in this the importance of the church in the present and the future. And that Jesus wants his church to continue to exist. Now, that's, that's interesting for us in this, from this perspective is that church is important to Jesus on a day-to-day, generation-to-generation basis. So it's important in that regard. Now, unfortunately, Christians are among the group who are avoiding going to church. And some of the reasons for it, some of the reasons are, quote, valid, good reasons, but let's, let's take a look. They quit going to church because the church has problems. And I am first to admit that church has problems. And that's all because of you and me that the church has problems. Now, just because we have problems, is that the ultimate reason not to go to church? Not to assemble yourself, 
for the reasons that God would have us to assemble. And that would be the last part of the sermon, that God has reasons for us to assemble. They also do not go to church because churches have personal agendas. Recently, someone was telling me that they were not going to church. They'd stopped going for several weeks because the church was on a church building fund program. So every week that they went, it was about donating to the church fund to build the church because they needed a bigger church. We need to grow our church. We need to have a church building. And they were leaving church every week feeling guilty because they had, you know, they contributed what they thought they could contribute, but it was week after week after week on a particular building fund. Now, I know that churches are also notorious in agendas and in, in fundraising, that you can have the basket pass through four or five times and the like. So what you do is you put something on the first thing and then you take it out on the second and you put it in the third and take it out in the fourth. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But people, you know, because of those things, there are agendas that people have. And one of those agendas is to build their church in their image. That is, they want to teach their doctrine how they understand things. And this is where church, again, my church and Jesus's church could be different. Um, and then, so they have agendas or the churches are built on the pastors, as they say, or they're built on boards, and the church board. They're also built on, their churches built on deacons because the deacons have power and, you know, and then there's authority and, rank and position and this is not new with the church because on the most in, um, self-sacrificing evening when Jesus was about to be crucified what were the disciples who are the apostles saying to one another who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of you know in the government of God the kingdom of God what kind of power what kind of office am I going to have while we are on the church, as we understand it, is a ministry of all believers, which is true, we are that, but it isn't about we're, we're seeking, you know, offices, and in fact, there's very little mention about office other than Jesus appointed people, the apostles, but that becomes an issue. And then there are churches built on politics that. They have a certain political leaning or a certain political view. And so when you go to church, you're, you're hearing politics preached. And they're, they're built on those things. Then there are churches built on single doctrines. It can be a, you know, a single doctrine. Well, just take the Baptists are called the Baptists because it's about baptism. It's about how to baptize and how that must be done. There are others built upon the organization of the church, the Presbyterians and the like. There, there are also, when we think about single doctrines, there, there could be Sabbath that as a single doctrine, or it could be Sabbath and holy days as a single doctrine. It could be, you know, ethnic groups, all, all of these things. You know, we, we have, you could have a, a church in a, in a group that are all white supremacists, thinking that this is what God wants, you know. Hate, hate your fellow man, and you're better than everybody else. So we, we do all these things, but is, is that the church that Jesus is building? Because Jesus doesn't make church, his church building easy on us. Because... We have to think, just think of a couple examples where Jesus made church building difficult. One is the thief on the cross. I'm assuming that the thief never attended church in his life. Number two, <laughs> the people, you know, oh, you're the thief. <laughs> Imagine going to church every week and you're the thief. Now, that, that isn't easy. Imagine going to church and your pastor is Saul. That's all you can think of, Saul. Oh, now his name is Paul. Yeah, right. 
you, you, know, you persecuted us, you killed part of my family, and now you're, you, now you're preaching to me, and hey, I, I've got a problem with this. Or imagine that, you know, it, it's anyone that, well, let's say, let's say in this case that Lazarus is your pastor, and you got a Holy, Holy Land Harvard degree, as a, and you're thinking, well, Lazarus, I, you know, I got this degree and you're the pastor. Who are you, Lazarus, to teach me anything? Which is what Jesus encountered because he didn't have that degree. But Jesus calls people. And we don't always agree with whom he has called and he puts us into contact with. We have difficulty with that. So you imagine the diversified church in, that Jesus would call where we come into. So unfortunately, we have these kind of problems. So now the question is, this is about church. How important does Jesus see the church? What does Jesus think of the church? Now, in this particular lesson, I want to go to Ephesians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul is, in one sense, he's writing about marriage, the relationship between husband and wife. But he's also writing something else. He's writing about the relationship to Jesus, to the church. And there are some incredible lessons here. So, and I would, I would assume that in our world today, this is going to bring some hostilities. And it might say, well, who are you to, to say this and, and make this a part of it? So, it's about husbands and wives, but we begin here in verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Oh, my. Now, that is a bit difficult. Now, who, who taught this? This is a, a doctrine of, of Jesus. I think, oh, yeah, I don't, as to the Lord, that, that's pretty tough. Then he says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now here, here's the point here. When it comes to church, who's in charge? Who is the head? Jesus is the head of the church. Now, not everybody agrees with that. I mean, uh, if, if you're a Christian, you, you believe that, that Christ is the head of the church are called Christian, but there are a lot of churches out there that Christ is not the head of the church. And, and, but here's what he's telling us here. Remember, he talks about there is one faith, one hope, one baptism, one God. So Christ is the head of the church. His, now, he says, his body. The church is his body of which he is Savior. That's another thing about church sometimes. Church can begin to feel like or think that we are the savior of mankind. I've never given a sermon that is going to save an individual. I am not the savior of mankind. But you, church can make you feel real guilty about you're not doing enough. And you need to do this to save mankind. It is Christ who's the head of the church. It is the Father who draws us to the Son, and the Son reveals the Father, the Holy Spirit working in us. So he is a Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so what did he just say here? What is the church to do? It is to submit to Christ. We live in a world today, even among Christianity, that do not agree with Jesus. On issues. And that's problematic. Now, can Jesus work with that? Yes, he can. I'm just saying um, how often that we ourselves struggle with submitting to Jesus. I mean, that's why the Father said, Listen to him. He knows who's talking. The church and churches sometimes will submit to Elijah, Moses, other prophets above Jesus. No, he is the head. We submit to Christ. 
So also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, how do we submit to Jesus, to the church? How does the church submit to Jesus? In everything. Not just some things, but in everything. Now, it gets scary in a world where you can't trust. If somebody has power over you and you can't trust, it gets real scary. But we're talking about Jesus and we're talking about his church and how his church should operate. Then he says, husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. So what is, how does Jesus feel about the church? He loves the church church. He loves, now the church has problems. Just like the husband has problems and the wives have problems and the kids have problems, but he loved the church. And what what did this head of the church do? He gave himself up for it to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the, with water through the word. Now, this again now speaks to, I will build my church. My church has my doctrine, the apostles' doctrine, the things that I taught the apostles, led by the Holy Spirit and all of that. But it's, the church is considered holy and sanctified and by the washing of the word. Now, what is the word? The word is the word of God and Jesus also is, is the word. To present her to himself as a radiant church. So the church is to be a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands, you ought to love your wives and their, as their own bodies. You know, where you, the church cares. You know, I, I speak often, I remind us, when you come to church, you should feel like, coming to a place where you are loved, where you are at home, where you will learn, where you will practice, where you will share. It's, it's a great place to come. And where you'll encounter people that will rub you the wrong way. And you're thinking, well, I, where do they get off on all these things? So he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body. And, um, you know, when it comes to the church, the body of Christ, we ought not be hating those whom Jesus has brought into the body. But he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. This is what Jesus is doing with the church. He feeds and cares for it. He did not tell Peter to do something that he himself doesn't do to the church. And what he told Peter is, if you love me, feed my sheep. So the church's responsibility is to feed and to care for the church, just as Christ has. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. So if Christ has this relationship with the church, how can we join with Jesus in having that relationship with the church? Because I see Jesus sitting down with the thief on the cross and help, and certainly his befriending him and he's feeling welcome and reconciled and he's having dinner with him and he's, yeah, he has a relationship with, with him. And so the, the church has that kind of responsibility as we, we see this. Now, when I say that the church is the body of Christ, I want to read also from the book of Ephesians chapter 22 and um, chapter, chapter 1 verses 22 and 23, again, where he says in speaking of the body, and in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We are being built together, brought together, which is, I mean, there's so many scriptures that Jesus gives to us and his disciples when he said, Father, you know, I pray that they may be one as we are one, that they may love one another with the love that I have loved them. 
This is what the church is supposed to be doing. This is how the church is supposed to be acting. I say supposed to be because we don't always do that. And so who is the head of the church? I want to read this from the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 where Paul again writes to us in this regard. In verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. In the church, Jesus has supremacy in everything in our life. We are the part of the body, but he rules our life. And, and we're put in the body. Here, here's the interesting. We are put in the body as it pleases him. You know, we're not always happy with the body that we've been put in and maybe where we are in the body. But it is where Jesus has has put us. And it's just, again, as a church, we're learning. So it appears that all Christian churches had problems. I want to mention this because you're not going to, even if you stay home, all by yourself, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have church problems. Um, let's just say you and your wife stay at home. Everything going to just go smoothly? I doubt it. I can almost guarantee it. Because with two people in one house who have two different views and opinions about things, it is not easy for them to agree and to get along after a while. Because once that that friction begins to build, it gets worse. It's when you come together and it's, it's, oh, it's amazing. Now, we call it hypocrisy in a way. But I have seen and heard people arguing all the way to church, open the car door and they're all smiles. They can barely get the smile out of their, and then when they see the deacon or the pastor, their smile gets even bigger. It gets like the mouth of a whale and the like, and then they're so nice and pleasant in church and then they go out and, you know, they're, they're at each other. And I can, I've seen it where they have not respected one another. This happened in this congregation within my hearing and the like, and somebody that I know, husband of some time back, she said something to him, and it was like, no, no, no. A few moments later, unbeknownst to that person, my wife came by and said the same thing, and they were so agreeable. And I called them on that. I said, why, you, you know what you just did? Your wife, whom you should respect, came in here, told you this, you discounted everything that she has. I'm just talking about the dynamics of people. You discounted everything she said. But then someone, the pastor's wife comes, and all of a sudden, oh yeah, I see that, understand it. This is not respecting one another. And this is what leads to discord in in, in situations. So, When we think about the church at Rome, did it have problems? Yes, it did. The church at Corinth, oh my, read there, they had fornication going on, they had had adultery going on, they had all kinds of things going on. Paul mentions all kinds of sin in terms of, in in Rome, how they they had no faith, that that they turned uh, God into four-footed creatures, how they went after their own lust and desires. That's the church at Rome. That's the world they lived in. Galatia, well, they, they, had, they had all kinds of turmoil in the church. And they were, you know, and this was about what to do. And it was about circumcision and, 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 and all kinds of, let's stay in the past. Everybody else has got to, we had to do it. You got to do it kind of thing. Ephesus, they had issues. Colossae, they had people who were Stoics saying, well, you shouldn't eat. You shouldn't drink. This is part of the church. And they had difficulty. But we never see Paul saying, let's disband church. Let's stop going to church. Rather, let's look to what Jesus teaches, what Jesus would have us to do, how the Holy Spirit would lead us. So let's just talk briefly now. Three points of why church is important. One is 
a statement from Jesus in terms of worship. The Father desires that we worship in spirit and in truth. But the point here is worship. The second point is that we need God's help to worship, and it has to be truthful. This is the church of Jesus that worships in spirit and in truth and welcomes all of those. And, you know, when, when you've got, you got a big group, you know, together, and we, we're sharing faith and we're sharing good things, and we're sharing also things that are hurtful and hard and things we're going through, and yet there's this encouragement I was talking to someone yesterday, and, and they were asking about an individual, and I said, well, you know, the, the person is, re- they lost their husband, but the person, you know, they're just upbeat about all of it, you know, they had a had, you know, long marriage, etc. I, I just couldn't be positive in that. You know, what makes it? Well, it's, it's an outlook of a knowing that God has a plan and a purpose and giving thanks to God for what you have, not always what you have lost, because in what you've lost, there are gains in all of our losses if we have Christ. So it's for worship. It's also for teaching. And it, because if we stay stuck in our minds, or even in our own little groups, or our own little cults, and we, we look at the same thing in the same way all the time, we won't learn anything. Jesus encountered that when he couldn't get them to change their traditions. All of these things, the apostles had that, that problem. The early churches had that problem. But we're, we're, we are devoted to learning about God, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us into all truth. It is also about fellowship and about sharing because we rattle around in our own heads and we, we come up with some weird ideas left to our own imagination. It really gets bad. So we need to come to church, we need to be taught, but we need to be taught from the Word of God, led by the Spirit of God, some opportunities for discussion around those things because in all that we, we perceive things differently. You know, when we sit down, just take for example, sit down uh, a man and a woman, or you know, members here, and we talk about what each gender has gone through, or, or different races, and we, we talk about these things. We can learn from one another, and we need to learn from one another. The problem is, and I, I'm going to call it a problem, is that we have, and this is where we, when Jesus is talking about, I will build my church, we've left God out of those things. Culture has become primary to our religious belief without God. What is a beauty is how beautiful culture is with Christ. Culture is absolutely beautiful with Jesus. Because I don't see Jesus, you know, cussing and calling things and all, all the things like cultures have been known to do or live a certain way. I don't see Jesus in a culture where he, he is just the 1% get richer and richer and richer. Uh, on the other hand, I don't see Jesus in a culture where a person says, I'm not working. Hey, I'm just going to, I'm just going to play video games. I'm 48. And, uh, I, you know, I don't, Jesus deals honestly. Cult, it is about God in our life. So teaching is important. And third is ministry. Because in all of this, what we learn is we share the gospel. And as I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago, we're entrusted to share the gospel of Christ Jesus. And it is for the building up of the body of Christ. And in all of this, every part of the body supplies our needs. Jeanette does singing. Richard's back there doing things I can't do. Richard's back there directing Dave and things that Dave can't do, but Dave would like to do and all of these things. We, we just go through generations. We, we all, and some of you come and sit and listen and learn. And we grow together and we share. It is about ministry. So I would say to us, let us join Jesus as he builds his church. 
according to his way, according to his model and what he wants out of all of us. If we join Jesus in building the church, we, it's like coming to church is always a, a point of worship. It is always a point, I, I've learned something, and I'll go to Mrs. McCrimmon. Mrs. McCrimmon would say to me, and you know what, how encouraging this would to be? I come to church because I might just learn one little thing. And thing. thank you for coming. And I say to people sometimes, thank you for coming because just one person can make a difference. And you just, they came. Jesus, Jesus loves the church. That's all there is to it. He absolutely loves the church. I'm just sorry that as, a, as churches go, all of us, we haven't represented Jesus well. And that, that, that's, that's the complaint. But that's no reason not to go to church. Because if you know the grace of God, even if you know the truth better, then you come, you can share that, and you might change somebody's life in a way that you never dreamed possible. In fact, most of the time, we change people's lives and never know it. And that's good. That's how God works often that. So let's conclude in prayer and give God thanks as we hopefully have enjoyed church today. Father, thank you so very much for this opportunity to come before you to be a part of the assembly that you've called us to. And hopefully, Father, we can provoke one another unto love and to good works, to your glory and praise and honor. Thank you for the great heavenly calling that you've given us all, and we thank you and give in Jesus' name. Amen. The world today is a challenging environment for Christian believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Looking for answers? Grace Communion International Local Churches in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto offers a comforting environment for Christians in search of spiritual growth and development. Contact a local ministry. Attend a local GCI churches at the times listed on your screen.